For the last 20 years, roughly, we as a society have ultimately set ourselves up for failure in many different regards. So when I say that we've set ourselves up for failure, I mean this in many different ways. And I really believe that this will be one of the more insightful episodes that I've done. So rather than just evaluate what's been happening to our society in the last little while, it's also important to break down what could happen, as well as how we are on some very dark paths economically, politically, and culturally. So I'll break this down. From an economic perspective, it has been argued that what goes up must come down, and it, so is the process of life. This is how it works. However, the coronavirus has arguably brought us some form of an artificially created recession, or not, I'll get to that in a moment, that has essentially done damage that may in fact take years to repair economically. Now, putting that aside, I think it's fair to say that from an economic view, in a lot of cases, we are living in a fairy tale of sorts, and COVID helped to show that. Now, you're probably asking, what do I mean by that? And so I, what I mean is this, we all remember what happened in 2008, right? You know, the banks lending like fucking ridiculous amounts of money to people, you know, who barely had enough income to even pay their bills. And yet, you know, the banks gave it out anyways, because the properties people were using that loan money for was to buy houses, you know, with, you know, with, which the banks used to um, show that the value of those houses was only going to go up and up in value. So the bank said, what the fuck? Because if people defaulted on their payments, uh, for whatever reason, then the banks would just take over the houses. Yeah, that whole thing, you know, like when CDOs in the stock market were propped up on complete horseshit, even though they were rated as top of the line AAA tra tranches. And then after that economic crash, you know, the government just created new money out of fucking thin air and bailed the, uh, bailed the banks out and shit, even though the banks and Wall Street were the ones that essentially created this mess. Okay, yeah. So you remember that, right? So we're on the same page here. And if not, I encourage you to go look it up. So it has been argued, and I'm no economic expert on this by any means here, but it has been argued that what happened in 2008 was bound to happen again eventually in one form or another. And supposedly, something along the lines of this was happening again in the start of the year 2013, roughly. However, the banks weren't as generous when lending out money like they were before. Now, the thing is this. Although it is hardly... For, it's, it's very difficult for the younger generation to get loans. It's, it's still fairly easy for people who have been working for long periods of time to receive loans from the bank, generally. I mean, it's pretty well known that they've eased up by now, but they're still much tighter than before. Now, here's the thing. Nobody, and I mean nobody, from the middle to lower class really took the time to think about putting money aside in case anything happened economically, let alone a pandemic like this one. However, what people did not understand or bother to imagine was that all aspects of life affect the economy. Now, I'm not an expert, but I'm very glad that this generation, specifically Generation Z, can learn from what has happened in the last couple decades and make sure that when it's their time to assume power and to dominate the workforce, they won't make the same mistakes. But at the same time, it's not entirely their fault either. Why? Because the price of everything keeps going up and up and up. And many would agree that the rate of inflation does not reflect the rate in which their paychecks are increasing. Now, I encourage anyone who has an idea as to how to solve this to obviously come forward and propose, uh, propose it to the right people. But here's the thing. Economic opportunity is being hoarded by those at the top. And I can't stress that enough. The closer you are to the bottom of that, you know, let's say pyramid, the greater chance you have of falling off of that pyramid entirely. In some communities, you start at the very bottom of this pyramid, and it's almost impossible to work your way to the top, hence why people resort to crime. Now, the reason that a lot of people don't resort to crime, however, is because a lot of people also have the choice of academics instead of crime. But that's not to say that those who have the academic route will always take it. And although we are supposedly living in a capitalistic market, the problem with that is that it isn't always the case. And I don't blame the people who set up the system. I blame the people who allowed corporate giants to take it over to the point where even a small body of business couldn't get a, a slice of their own of the pie. I blame the lack of government regulation. And so this tapers down to an economic perspective because, as you'll hear me mention in future episodes, corporations have a much easier time of financially surviving this pandemic than those of, you know, working individuals and small businesses. And so 
Even though the economic numbers have looked pretty damn good over the last handful of years, the problem is that those numbers have largely been attributed to the corporations. And so I think it's important to understand that when corporations are vastly responsible for the surging economic numbers and the fact that, you know, they're leaving little to no room for the medium to small size businesses to actually play a part. The regular everyday Joe is walking down the street as happy as can be, but he's not realizing that if a, pl a pandemic or global catastrophe hit, he is fucked. And that's the other thing too. The possibility of a pandemic or some type of global catastrophe is always on the table and it always has been. It's just that we've been lucky enough to avoid it, but this time around we got hit. And <clears throat> you may question why the economy would have the ability to go down the tube so quickly. Because, you know, the quarterly economic numbers that you would read in the paper every day or every quarter were so good. And again, that's because people did not realize that economic opportunity was being hoarded at the top of this, let's, again, of this pyramid. Now... That isn't to say that there's no room for new businesses. I'm not saying that. In fact, there probably isn't a better time to start a business, business than right now. And I've written about this on my website as well. But the idea that economic opportunity has largely been based on where your zip code is, meaning where you live, is something that needs to be resolved. Because as good as our system is, it's not perfect. And there are a lot of people that are still suffering out there. Now, this whole concept of what I just spoke about intertwines directly with politics. Politicians, depending on which political party, have either been in favor of regulation or against it. But what neither party has succeeded in doing is getting those poor communities out from under. And I'd like to think that the reasons for this is that even though helping impoverished neighborhoods and communities get out from you know under is actually a fantastic investment in the long term, it doesn't do anything to benefit the current leader's political agenda, especially when it's contained within a four to eight year period, right? That's not long enough. They need a longer amount of time, regardless of which party. It doesn't matter. Democrat or Republican, liberal, conservative, doesn't matter. And so as a matter of fact, since the Clinton administration, both major political parties have taken up arms with big business. Now, that used to be strictly a conservative or, you know, Republican thing in the years prior to that. Now, even though Democrats still tend to enforce more regulations on big businesses and banks and whatnot, it's not what it used to be. Not since, you know, the, the, the late 90s. And so the debate about regulation versus deregulation will always be an ongoing battle all the time. Now, if you deregulate and cut taxes to allow businesses to operate more freely, it is supposed to, in theory, allow businesses to end up paying more tax through, you know, sheer volume simply because... In theory, they'll be doing so much more business and have so much more freedom that they wouldn't mind paying a lower uh, rate in exchange for more volume. However, that's not what happens most of the time. More often than not, when you deregulate, you have businesses taking advantage of loopholes and storing more of their cash overseas where the IRS or CRA can't touch them. And, you know, so on and so forth. Now, if you regulate too much, which, you know, more democratic leaning individuals and you know democrats often make the mistake of doing i think you limit business and you lessen the chance of investment and whatnot and it doesn't make those ceos happy <clears throat> and so they will move their jobs overseas oftentimes if you know the current administration doesn't at least negotiate and come to the table to make a deal and so in a lot of cases, businesses will then just send more of their shit overseas, like manufacturing and even, you know, transferring their own cash overseas because there are too many, uh, too many regulations in their home country. So at the end of the day, it's all about finding that balance. The problem politically is that everything from medicine to finance to insurance to healthcare to everything else you could think of on the table is all intertwined. The major companies tend to always dictate what is best for them and use their employment numbers as negotiating leverage when it comes time to sit down with the government. And so if both the government and big business are too busy, you know, sucking each other off under the table, who the fuck is going to take care of the impoverished communities, right? And so I think that this was part of the reason why Trump was elected, so to speak. And I say this from a non-biased uh, point of view, because, because of the fact that he was viewed as an outsider, in a lot of aspects. But whether you like him or not, he, he really doesn't fix the problem, which is that poor communities and neighborhoods need serious help. 
Now, I'm more than convinced in many aspects that because of the lack of help these communities have received over the last many, many years, most of them being African-American, on top of the fact that some police were abusing their power in these communities, a cultural uprising was going to happen sooner or later. I'm pretty convinced that what people of all color are petitioning for is more than just the killing of George Floyd. Although Mr. Floyd played a big role in sparking this whole thing, I think what they're pushing for is true equality to that of Caucasians and uh, and whatnot. They want the same uh, fairness and equality and levels of opportunity that whites have had for a long time, and I agree. I don't blame them. Now, there are a lot of factors to this, but one thing I like to talk about is the fact that Radical left and radical right groups are using all of this chaos as a means to push their own agenda and as a means to attempt to create some form of political propaganda. And the scary thing about this is that this couldn't have been, depending on how you look at it, a better or worse time, depending on how you view it. Because the West, mainly America, is so divided right now, they're divided right down the middle, that they refuse to hear each other's sides and perspectives. And people seem to be forgetting the first thing that is crucial and the first thing that is significant to us as a species, which is communication. I can't believe I'm saying that. Communication is not only crucial, but it is what will literally prevent us from having a fucking civil war. And it may be far-fetched in the eyes of some people, but in a lot of cases, it would not surprise me it really wouldn't if some form of a civil war broke out, if nobody steps in to calm down the violence and the rage from both the radical left and the radical right. Now, the other problem is what institutions play in all of this. Institutions most often in the past really stayed out of things. But because there's been such an uprising and such anger, they have actually joined in on what's been going on. And they've essentially been forced to take a side politically. And what do you think they're going to do? They're going to take the side of whichever view seems to signify itself as the more popular and pre uh, prevalent one. And to that, my solution for big companies in and institutions would be this. Nobody say a fucking thing. No one say a word about anything. No major company comment on anything and nobody say shit. Every single com I If I had all the CEOs down at a t sat sitting down at a table... And it was up to me to delegate what they should say. I would say everyone stay the fuck out of it. Now, why do I say this? Hear me out. I say this because if you look at it, the companies or institutions that have not gone on board to affiliating with a political message, which is mostly left-leaning in this case, have gotten in big shit by the public through both in-person and online petitions and outreach. How do you solve this problem? I have the perfect answer. Nobody say anything. Now, I'll explain. What this does is it allows people to divert their attention elsewhere because what are people going to do? Boycott every single corporation and institution in America if everyone stays fucking silent? No. Because if they did, then you wouldn't have a country. These companies are allowing themselves to be put in the spotlight for no reason other than the fact that it might increase their sales in certain aspects. But that's only short-term thinking in my opinion. And so I hope you can see that with everything that is going on right now, everything is sadly intertwined. And I'll likely be making a second part to this later on because I can't cover everything in one shot. But I hope I've done a decent job of describing how in this current climate, everything that's going on tends to be intertwined and interconnected. And in a lot of cases, especially with what's going on right now, that is not a good thing.